over here in Mike Campbell's, I don't know what you call this now, this is kind of like the pseudo office. This is uh, the man cave. This is the coolest place I think I've ever been. Anyhow, I'm Dave McPherson and I'm Sean. We're here with Mike. Hello, Mike. How's it going? Good, brother. And we'll do, uh, we'll probably do a little walk around. Mike's got some amazing, amazing memorabilia and stuff in here. But uh, we want to have Mike on today because uh, everybody will know Mike from the Carlton. We'll get him to kind of give his history on that. Uh, Dave and I, geez, I can't remember when it was. We saw Petty Larceny there when they played in the summertime. Yep. yep. Uh, it was a great show. Um, I played the bar a couple times. Uh, I, I think it's a great bar, good sound, good atmosphere. Amazing sound, amazing room. That, anyway, that Mike, like how's, how are things going right now? Obviously, everything's shut down, but... Uh... Well, things are going about as well as they can possibly go. You know, we're in the same boat as everybody else is, so I think, but like everyone else, I'm pretty sure... I get a little tired of this, so this is the third lockdown we've endured, and the second one in six months, so it's discouraging on the one hand, but at least now we've got a vaccine on the horizon that seems to be rolling out of pace at this point, and, uh, and keep your fingers crossed that at least by the fall we can start to return to some sense of normalcy, barring some other weirdness that we haven't seen yet. So the variant stream or something else. Now they're talking about like the, the vaccine penetration numbers in the states. I mean, there's some huge concerts that they're talking about booking in, in New York and in, in Kentucky is another big yeah, one. There was one in Texas that took yeah. place actually. So I mean, so do you think that'll happen here if we get the, the 75 percent penetration? I think that we're going to be way more uh, conservative than they are in the states, um, and I think it's all going to come down to vaccination numbers. That obviously and the. You know, and the fact that new cases have to keep tumbling and stuff, but there's, I think it's got everything to do with the vaccination penetration. So, um, and this province, I don't think, has the reticence that some places in the states have for getting a vaccination. Right. So, I think, you know, um, I've got a couple of roommates here at the house, and one of them is only 25. He just booked his appointment. So, right. Right. we're starting to get down to the point where. Most adults in the province will be vaccinated certainly by the middle of June, and uh, I think I think by the end of the summer we got a good shot at it. But right. I don't think we're going to be seeing any major outdoor shows here or anything until at least the fall. I, I would guess. So we're, we're one year in. How's this in, how's this pandemic affected your industry now, Mike? And, and maybe for the public home, like. So well, I think without do. government subsidies and everything, uh, you know, like, like we're, you know, we're a bar, we're a restaurant, and we're a live music venue, so it's a triple whammy. In some cases, we're not really designed to do takeout food orders and that right. kind of stuff. You know, the people that come to our place, um, you know, more people should just come there for dinner, even if you don't like Latin music, because the kitchen's great. But, you know, I think our our primary um, audience of people that like live music. So yeah. that's the hook to get them in. And obviously without being able to do as much of it as we'd like, uh, it's it, it's a little more difficult on us, but without the government subsidies and, and help from uh, all the sectors of government, I think most of the restaurants and the stuff in the city would have shut down by now. You know, you don't make a lot of money in the industry, period. Right. Um, although it would be galling beyond belief to have worked 10 or 15 years and saved a bunch of money and then had to spend it all just to keep the doors open and get staff employed. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, it wreaks havoc with my schedule. Uh, before Christmas, we had, I think we were open, probably going to be open seven days a week leading up to Christmas, and we had a ton of sold out Christmas shows. Yeah. Which, you know, you can't just reschedule in January because it's Christmas. They're yeah, Christmas right. shows. That's Christmas right. is over. That's right. Um, uh, but, uh, so trying to fill those gaps and then moving forward ahead, and the same thing happened to us this spring. Had a ton of sold out shows and, you know, figure well, we closed for, God, a month, maybe. Yeah. The Christmas lockdown, I think, was four weeks or three weeks. This one's longer. So we rescheduled shows and then it's going to go longer and have to reschedule the rescheduled shows and it's a big domino effect and i think a lot of the acts that we had booked in the spring are not going to have availability um so i'll have to wind up booking them through august in which case yeah. i'll be finished booking and then i still don't know what's happening with my halifax urban folk festival at the end of august through Labor Day weekend so you know, fingers crossed, but I'm feeling a lot more optimistic about what's going to happen in the next three weeks to a month 
um, because I think it'll it'll mean it'll mean the end of the pandemic, right? As opposed to let's keep going till the next lockdown happens. Yeah, yeah. So it's an encouraging sign. I, I, I like to go to back to that, but this is not your first time having to go through some of these things. When you uh, when they were building the new trade center, and I had <laughs> talked to you, we were talking about this. Um, you guys are obviously in a spot where you're right across the street from it. Um, and I remember a little from the wooden, wooden monkey was having the same problems. Oh, yeah. You guys were having a very hard try tr time trying to get, convince the city um, what was going on and how uh, unrestful it was for your business. Talk about that a little bit because, I mean, it's impressive that you were able to overcome that and keep that place going. Well, there's a lot of factors that went into that, but um, the construction part of it, um, I mean, we had a vacant lot there for a number of years, right, which made the sun and the patio kind of nice. Right, right, right. Although the vacant lot across the street, which used to be the Halifax Herald building, was basically a rat playground or resort. Mm -hmm. You know, there was concrete uh, um, foundations that were full of water, so you know, mosquito breeding grounds mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and all kinds of crap. So it was an eyesore. Um, but it did make for a sunny patio. So I don't think there was anybody in the street that didn't want to see some kind of project going through there. And I know lots of people wanted all kinds of crazy things like parks and stuff, which is nice, but Halifax has got an embarrassment of parks compared to most large urban centers. So what we needed, I thought, was you know some commercial thing, whether it was a convention center or not, I didn't really care. I just wanted something built there, and I think everybody on the street did too. But what we didn't realize was that the uh, developers were gonna, just going to be able to basically do whatever they wanted to do. So, um, and however long it was time, it took. Right, and it was only supposed to be a two and a half year project and wound up being more than five years. Mm -hmm. um, and we very quickly discovered that uh, there, was, there was absolutely no way on earth that uh, the city uh, or the provincial government was going to reimburse any of the businesses for anything. So, so talk about that for a second, okay? So you're, A, what was the communication like during that? And B, because um, I've had a personal situation where you get a little bit of hope where you think they're going to come on side and help you, then all of a sudden they just pull the carpet up and you get that uh, thanks but no thanks. Talk about that process because that must have been very frustrating. Well, it was mostly frustrating because, we, well, nobody really talked to us about it. Nobody really knew how horribly it was going to affect business, but it was like turning off a tap once they started. Right. Um, you know, they blasted for six months. I even had my, my partner at the time, Mike Rhodes, uh, from my old Mike and Mike show at Much Music, had buttons made up saying I had a blast at the Carlton. <laughs> because, because every time they were about to, to, to do a blast down there, I mean, they put the blast barriers on and stuff so people didn't get showered with rocks, but it was still dangerous. So, you know, especially in the summer, there's Literally tourists across around. The street. Yeah, the tourists are around, yeah. they have no idea what's happening. A horn goes off and people start pushing them into businesses. And sometimes it was us, you know, so all these people standing there looking out the window wondering what was going to happen. Right. And then it was like, bang, big blast. And then we'd hand out these buttons to people and say, you know, come back later and have a drink kind of thing. Okay. Um, but uh, cities, and this isn't just, you know, Halifax, it's anywhere. I mean, right now in Toronto, the Young and Eglinton area, they have a massive billion, billions of dollars project to increase the, the hub for uh, the TTC there. And hundreds and hundreds of businesses have gone under, under, just gone under. You can't get to them, you can't move around, you can't drive through the area, you can't do anything. But cities uh, don't want to be liable for it. So. Well, that's my question, I guess. Who is the liability to play? Who's the accountability factor with? Because, I mean, it wasn't, you were, you're an established business there. They had this new idea. Why should you have to suffer? Why should Little McPherson have to suffer? Because they decided to take a you know, two-year project into five years and, to your point, use blasting caps in the middle of the day or whatever. It's, 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 you well, there was, a bunch of, there was a bunch of extenuating circumstances that went with it, that, and, and we didn't like, know everything or learn everything immediately. Mm -hmm. Like I found out that uh, every time they had to close one of the streets, which was all the time, yeah. They were charging the developer, you know, a hundred thousand dollars here, a hundred and fifty thousand dollars here, you know, this, that, and the other thing. So they were paying all these fines, right? And uh, the businesses, you know, all of us were going, well, why don't you put that in a pot, someplace, yeah, and then dole it out to the affected businesses to pay for the damage that you're doing. Lost revenue. And instead, they just took all that money and put it in the city's general coffers yeah. and mm -hmm. used it for other stuff. 
So I think, you know, deciding that they were going to give us any money at all would admit that there was some, you know, they shouldered some responsibility for it. I got nowhere with anybody at the city. There was plenty of, oh, we feel for you, but there was absolutely nothing they were going to do to help us. Um, we all got together as a group. I think it was 15 or 16 of us and one of the law firms in town uh, said that they would argue our case uh, pro bono, uh, which gave us a glimmer of hope. And there was a couple of things that they thought they might be able to use to force the city into dealing with us uh, legal, legally, yeah. like, uh, avenues to pursue. So I think they were going to, uh, they took the case to the Utility Review Board, which hands like liquor licenses and all kinds of things and sets rates for, you know, um, electricity and all that kind of crap, and thought if they could get it to them, then we'd have an opportunity for some kind of consideration, but they kicked the case back to the, to the province or something. They wouldn't hear the case, so we were effectively done at that point. And that was, you know, six months of a lot of work by the, by the uh, nice folks at the law firm. But uh, at that point, and it wasn't even just Argyle Street, I mean, um, Barrington Street, the same yep. thing, Attica, the, the furniture was yep. screwed, they were going out in the toilet. And we would have definitely 100% gone, would have gone down the toilet because it was, it, 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 our revenues were cut, like, more than half. It was just, there was nowhere to park. You yeah. know, giant holes across the street. I mean, at one point, you had to take a, you know, walk across a couple of planks to get across a ditch, you know, to get into the place. So as a last desperate measure, I launched a Patreon campaign um, where I got a bunch of artists to make little pitches to, you know, consider contributing to the Carlton. So, you know, July Talk did it, and Stephen Fearing did it, and the Sky Diggers, and, like, and lots of local artists, Plas Plaskett, Mays, and those folks and friends of mine put it together in a nice little pitch reel, and I honestly didn't think that anything was going to come of it. It was such a desperate move. But um, uh, my own customers contributed somewhere in the neighborhood of $5,000 a month wow. for the better part wow. of the year. That's incredible. Yeah, it's insane. See, you know, like, this is a lot about your character, because people just don't do that. Like, you don't get those kind of friends, those kind of artists that, that'll, that'll work on your behalf. You don't get those kind of customers that'll donate $5,000 a month without being the kind of guy that, that they that they identify with, that they that they appreciate, and that they want to work with, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's surprised. I mean, it was very, very humbling. I didn't even take a look at the list of people. I didn't want to know. I didn't want to know who was and who wasn't or anything else. But the response from the artists to, to make the pitch for me was, was really touching. And again, I was shocked by the amount of money that they, that they contributed. My ask was for a year. You know, a year of support. And then I would ask people, like, like, what do you want? You know, you want a T-shirt? Do you want, like, <laughs> is it, you know, the Patreon thing is usually something. And everybody's just like, no, we just want the place to stay alive and we want to be able to come there. Like, you know, and I'd offer people deals on tickets and stuff. It's like, no, we don't mind. Uh, but, you know, there was a lot of people kicked in. And uh, after a year, the place still wasn't finished, you know. So in the end, it did actually cost me the bar. Uh, because it was a hole that we couldn't quite climb out of, so I wound up having to sell it. But at least it didn't cost me my house right. and sure. this place. And well, because I do all remember you talking things. in the media about that, about the fact that it was getting darn near close to you oh, yeah. possibly losing your house. Oh yeah, it was it was oh. over. <laughs> well, and, and I, I want to go back and talk about you know, when you when you got involved in the place and whatnot. But um, what I do remember, because I was following all that quite a lot, because obviously I was part of the industry, and what I remember, I could sense the frustration without talking to anybody. I didn't get anybody being snippy or being whatever. Everybody was respectful in the media, and I I could sense the frustration because, I mean, one of the counselors comes out a month or so ago, and he was talking about when Neptune was trying to get that funding, and he said, I don't think that uh, Halifax should be in the COVID revitalization, revitalization business, which to me is like, you're doing all this stuff to shut things down and, and whatnot, and then you make that statement. So, I mean, I, I, I get what you're saying. and Yeah, it's, uh, it, you know, who knows? I mean, politicians are politicians. Very you know, I'm old enough at this point. I get people talking to me about politics all the time. It's just like, well, I don't care whether you're a liberal or a conservative or NDP or whatever the hell. I've lived in this province long enough. 
that I've seen all three governments, and yeah. not a single thing changes for me. It's exactly the same every single time. Well, you would notice it as a business owner, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Well, of course, I'm a business owner um, who doesn't live where my business is. Right. So the, the counselor in charge of the area my business is in doesn't really give a shit, do I think? Who is because that I can't vote for Mason? Yes. Yeah, okay. Anyway. I can't vote for it, yeah. you know, because I live in the West sure. End here. You know, so uh, so that's frustrating. Like, I think business owners should have a vote, or, you know, somehow, or a business somehow. Who knows? Like, this is what we've been talking about for so long. And it's like, we just, if they just had a voice. If they just had, like, and they said, join an association. And you were probably part of the restaurant association. Or, oh, yeah. You know what I mean? And I, I'm not going to poop on them, per se, but, I mean, our, I guess the feedback we've been getting from our friends is that it's kind of bullshit. It doesn't matter which association you're with. Uh, whether it be from a musician's perspective or a bar owner's perspective or a restaurant owner's perspective, it all is just, they give you a little, little tap on the shoulder and, and touch on the, on the way out the door. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, we'll you know, there, the was, there was a lot of we feel for you. For exactly. Right. And, you know, Mayor Savage has been, you know, like, he's powerless to do anything about it, but he's always encouraged us and, you know, he's been to the place for functions and sometimes they organize functions that have the place to help and that kind of thing. But, you know, we're a lot of independent businesses, you know, so they're all mostly small businesses belong to the Restaurant Association or, you know, the Downtown Business Association or the Chamber of Commerce, like all of these things. And uh, as local businesses and entrepreneurs, you know, yeah, it's generally speaking, you know, as far as government's concerned, you're on your own. Mm -hmm. um, we get taxed higher than anything else. We employ more people, but you know, we don't have the weight of, you know, huge political donors or anything. So... Um, you know, but it, but everybody's scrappy about it. You know, like Lil from the Wooden Monkey. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we were all in that fight together, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you just get used to the bureaucracy and nobody really giving a shit. You know, yeah. and those people work their nine to five hours That's or right. eight to four hours. That's they have, right. They have index pensions. They get automatic exactly. raises. You know, all of this stuff. They don't That's, have to. They don't have to. Real, real disappointing statement. Not that from, from you, but that that a business owner says that to me because for the last since we've started talking to people during the shutdown that's exactly what i've been hearing that's exactly what we thought and you know you're making us sound pretty smart <laughs> 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 we knew what was happening, right? well you know it's 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 getting that way i mean one of the biggest issues that we had was parking you can only call oh the second this thing happened they started taking parking spaces away and they did a whole bunch of stupid things downtown. Stupid bike riders and stuff. Yeah. Well, you know, there was a whole section of Argyle Street you couldn't park there after midnight. And it was like, why mm. in the name of God would you do that? And this goes back years and years now. But, you know, apparently the police requested it because they were having trouble getting emergency vehicles to the mm. dome because of traffic. And I'm like... You don't need to clear the area out at the bottom of Carmichael Street. You're a cop. Go down the street the wrong way. Yeah. I mean, instead of, like, towing people away after midnight and tourists don't know what's going on, or never mind the, the staff that, you know, female staff that has to drive from a long way away because the bus service doesn't go very sure. long. Yeah. They're not drinking, you know, but they need a place to put their cars, and it's late night. It's mm -hmm. dangerous. You know, they can't do that anymore. They're going to take cabs work all night just to be able to afford to take a cab home. Like so, can you give us that stuff didn't make any sense. Give us a little history about how you came to Nova Scotia in the first place because a lot of folks might not remember the whole Mike and Mike, you know, the excellent Avengers you know, from much music. Like, how did this whole thing start for you? Like, uh, Well, before I had an on-air gig at Much Music, I was doing a job there called, uh, my first job at Much was in affiliate relations, which meant I had to go around and talk to cable companies about uh, carrying much music in the first place and then marketing much music because when we first went on the air, we weren't on basic cable, so right. we had to pay for it. That's right. So I, when we first got the license, I wound up traveling across the country, talking to cable companies and all that stuff. So I'd been coming here for uh, a long time before I moved here. And my dad was in the Air Force, so I also... You know, at one point at my grade 12 year, I spent at the Summerside PEI. My mm -hmm. first year of university was at Acadia University. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I left and, and it started the traveling thing with much. But I always really liked the East Coast. And when Mike and I were um, started Mike and Mike's Excellent Cross Canada Adventures, obviously we came to the East Coast and we came as often as we could. 
And uh, I really liked it and thought, you know, Halifax. Well, it's got to be like the best kept secret in the whole country. Mm -hmm, you know, yeah. I don't understand why it's still a small city. It should be, Jesus, what isn't it like? You know, it's on the ocean. It's really close to New York, Boston, and London, and everything. You know, winters. Are, Nova Scotia is the only province in the country where the average temperature is above zero True. every month of That's the right. year. Yeah. Well, you know, they're in southwestern British Columbia, <laughs> yeah. but then there's northwestern British Columbia, yeah. you know, so yeah. you're taking the average of the whole province. Um, so I thought, you know, God, it might be nice to live in Halifax, and then as luck would have it, I met a woman who lived in Halifax, and, uh, hey, you know, it was one of those things. So I wound up getting married. And um, she was in medical school and couldn't really leave the province, you know, had to finish school. So I was like, I talked to my bosses and said, generally speaking, I get on a plane and I fly someplace to go to work. So who cares if I fly out of Halifax or I fly out of Toronto? What's the difference? And when we're shooting stuff in the East Coast, I don't have to fly at all. I'm already here. Right. Um, and I could probably do stuff for you when I'm not on the road, because we also own Chum, is our parent company, so we also own ASN and ATV right. and C100 yeah. and all these media outlets. So there were cameras here and stuff, and if I needed to do, they needed me to do something, I'd just book a camera from the TV station and, you know, go cover the East Coast Music Awards or right. something, while I was still doing the Mike and Mike show. Um, and I also knew the Mike and Mike show was going to come to an end. Right. Like, we'd been doing it for six years. We'd already been everywhere. Um, our budgets were getting cut. You know, it was becoming, like, I know they're going to cut this off the knees. But I also knew that they wanted to do an uh, East Coast version of Much West because Much West had been in the air for quite some time. And I knew that they wanted to do something out East. And I figured that if I was out there, and, and uh, the Mike and Mike show was over that there was every chance that they would ask me to host the Much East show. And that's, there was another Mike that did that show, though, I think. Mike Clattenburg, wasn't it? No, Clattenburg was doing something for the cable company. Yeah, that damn cable show. That damn cable it. show. Yeah. Mike interviewed Mike and I when we were in town for the Mike and Mike show a bunch of times. Mm -hmm. So Clattenburg, I mean, Clattenburg, we got a bunch of proposals at Much from a bunch of people. And uh, people asked me to support their, their um, proposals, and I did. Uh, people that knew me from out here, and I did, because I wanted to see Much East, too. But it didn't happen, and it didn't happen, and then I was here, and then for the first time in my life, probably exactly what I expected to happen, happened. Right. So I get the phone call saying that the show was canceled, which was completely no surprise to me. Mm -hmm. So that was the bad news. And then the good news was that we want to start a much e show, we want you to host it. And the bad news is that you're going to be the cameraman, the producer, the editor, and the host. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> All of those things at once. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so it was like, you know, a romantic thing that got me here, but I always wanted to come here. And uh, as a guy who's living in Toronto, being able to walk into the city, find a house like this for, like, less money than it would cost for a single car garage in sure. Toronto. Right. And I was like, this is smart. This is not, I'm in the right place. Your garage would be worth right a million time. dollars in Toronto oh for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, strangely enough, real estate agents or uh, 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 housing appraisers and banks don't consider this building to be worth anything. Really? Because you can't put a car in it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I yeah. love this building. So, you know, it was a, it, there was some happenstance that got me here in the first place. But um, once I was here, I was happy I moved here, and uh, also when Much East started, it was right when shit was happening in Halifax, so right. uh, the Halifax pop explosion had just started. Uh, Early 90s, but it's Sloan and Sub yeah, Pop records. Yeah, and Sloan, and, um, and then uh, Sub Pop was, showed up and started signing everything that moved, so they signed Jail and Eric's Trip, and... And uh, said everybody but the band I was in, I had to move to Toronto. To ah, 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 <laughs> well, you know, there was a lot of nosing around. I even had a, I even had a woman, uh, I forget where she was based in San Francisco, I think, and uh, she worked for Levi's. And she came to town and somebody pointed her in my direction, somebody to show her around and show what was happening. So, you know, I took her out to all the, the, the clubs in town at the time. And she was, you know, one of these 
you know, tastemaker types, well, like harness the taste making. So she came here because she knew there was an independent music scene here, and that's where a lot of fashion gets started. So, sure. strangely enough, you know, I'm showing some some uh, some fashion person from San Francisco around Halifax while they try and steal fashion tips yeah. from the indie rock scene here, which was surrealistic. That's but crazy to think about it. Yeah. But that's how much attention that was being paid to the place. But I was here just when that stuff was happening, so it was a perfect time to be here. And uh, there was a lot to cover. There was a lot of great music. Yeah. Um, you know, at the time, the ECMAs, if you didn't have a fiddle in the band, you couldn't win. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, I think my show helped that too. The other thing that we also kick-started here was video production mm -hmm. because there was tons of bands, but there was no videos. Right. Uh, so it was important to get that industry kick-started. Uh, you know, um, much music had their video grant system, Video Fact. Yep. And I was encouraged to find bands and have them apply to Video Fact. And you know, it took a while for decent directors and, and uh, shooters and stuff to come up to do the to, to make the videos. But once it started happening, there was a snowball effect. And then when Sloan got signed, more labels came around looking for stuff. And you know, CKPU was great. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, Q104 back in those days was a lot less regimented, and there was just, you know there was a lot more local support and media for local stuff. And uh, you know, Mutt G's just kickstarted it to a to a national level, and that thing really helped a lot of bands. So I'm particularly proud of that part of the career. So you're doing all that. So at what point does the Carlton happen? At what point does that start? Well, the Carlton happens. You know, I've been at Much for a long time. Uh, at that point, uh, you know, like about 15 years, I think I've been working there. Still roses, said right. Still roses, Cantina. Hmm? Still Rose's Cantina at that point, was it? Oh yeah. yeah. Well, when I, hmm, not when I, not when I got to town. It was closed. Yeah, it yeah. was closed. But when I was first coming to town, um, you know, back in the mid '80s, for, yeah. for much doing that cable job, like it was open. So, and when Mike and when Mike and I first started the Mike and Mike show before I moved here, that was always a stop. You know, we'd always stop at Rose's. Uh, <laughs> well, we stop into a lot of bars. Yeah, yeah. Because, well, you know, it was like a playground for adults. You know, you go from the Thirsty oh, Duck to Thackeray's, and then when Thackeray's closed, then you'd go to go to Rose's, or if there was Just a band before playing. you finish the story, I remember being at the Palace one night, and we're winding up at a party with Mike and Dan Gallagher. Oh, Jesus. And they were down here for some, I don't remember what it was, but uh, it was... There was only one thing that we could have been down there. Both of those guys were in town for at the same time, and that would have been, I think, the... The um, the much music um, Pepsi Challenge train went across Canada. That's exactly what it was. It was 1990, and the train yeah. wound up in Halifax, and Gallagher was with us, and Blue Rodeo, and Lee Aaron, yeah. and a whole yeah. bunch of folks when the train wound up uh, ending here. But Roses was around, but when I moved here, it wasn't around anymore. Right. So Mike and Mike, the Mike and Mike show went for like six whatever years, and then Much East went for quite a few years. And then they amalgamated Much East and Much West into one show, one one-hour show instead of two one-hour shows. So you can see the writing on yeah. the wall, like big time, they were just trying to save money. And the only reason those shows really happened was that Much needed to get their can coin in, and they weren't, didn't have it. Right. So they relied on our shows to, to provide the Canadian thing, which is cynical as hell, but at least it gave us a chance to do that stuff. So when that ended, uh, you know, they said, yeah, you're too old, you know, whatever. Then, um, uh, so I started doing other stuff, you know, so I managed Joel Plaskett, uh, with Sherry Jones, who put together a company with Sherry to manage Jewel before we'd even talked to Jewel. We started a company to manage Jewel before we'd even talked to him. Um, but thank God we convinced him it was a smart thing to do. <laughs> and I was taking like contract gigs, so you know, I booked all the pop rock entertainment for the National Arts Center's Atlantic Scene um, Festival, the National Arts Center in Ottawa, and then I did. Uh, produced Juno Fest for the Junos when they were in town, but it was like pillar to post kind of thing, and right. it was, nothing was really falling into my lap, and I didn't really feel like applying for a camera job at one of the TV stations or something, because I thought, you know, something else should happen or would happen. So plan C was kind of like, I like it, I always open a bar or 
restaurant or something, and how hard could that be? <laughs> right. I've been in millions of them. <laughs> I know the good ones, and I know the shitty ones, so I'll just make a good one. That's right. And then, uh, then you come up against and you know realize that oh yeah, it is harder than you think yeah. it is, buddy. Well, first of all, it costs a lot of money. So I had to find investors, and so I mean, I'd already signed to lease that space before I had an investor, which. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. It's the dumbest thing a human being can do. But I was so... But you're committed, though, right? Oh, well, I, I was committed at that point. should have been committed. Well, I should have, <laughs> yes, exactly. I should have been committed. But um, anyway, I decided that I could do that. And Mike wasn't doing anything particularly challenging in Toronto. So I convinced him to move down, thinking that... You know, if anybody could even remember the Mike and Mike show, we're definitely at the tail end of that recognition. Right. So maybe it would get us some attention. And, you know, Mike's, a, you, know, f you know, put him on as a bartender in the afternoon or something. People would sit around and be abused by him all day. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that turned out happening. But, uh, you know, so we finally got the investors together. It cost us more money than we thought it was going to. We put the place together. We were months late in opening, that kind of thing. And for the first three or four months, things were pretty cool, quite good. Argyle Street was a yeah, yeah. great place to be. The yeah. Bustling. The Herald Building was across the street. Right, right, every right. every restaurant in Argyle Street was full at lunch because there were 300 employees right. over there. Uh, so everything was great. And then uh, in September 2008, the bottom fell out of the world economy yeah. and everything stopped. Yeah. So when we started to pull out of that, then the Nova Center shot started, yeah. you know, so I never ever really got to that great spot. Although I was loved the location, I loved the fact that it, you know, it's a slate, slate building, there's oh, slate walls beautiful. in the building and stuff, and it's history and the fact that it's as old as it is, That's and right. all of those things, right? So, um, I didn't initially start out to be a live music venue, like, not even close because I also booked the marquee for a couple of years right. uh, before I opened the Carlton and stuff. I know how difficult it is. You know? And Halifax had gone from a place that I could remember in the late 80s where I could come to town on a Wednesday night in February mm -hmm. and, uh, and at 2 o'clock in the morning I could go into the palace, I could go into the dome, I could go into the crazy horse and find 1,500 people yep. at 3 o'clock the morning yep. in the middle of the week mm -hmm. yep. and there were probably 20 places in town in those days that booked live original music and you know by the time I opened the car we were down to nowhere near that number like nowhere near that number so uh, I knew how precarious the live music thing could be and uh, but because of who I was everybody immediately assumed that there would be a live music component to it and it's something that I wanted to do right. but the space didn't really you know the space suggested to me especially with the sound system that we put in there that you know it should be acute that it should be acoustic music and uh, because it's acoustic music that you know people should be required to pay the fuck attention instead of talking through the show right on brother and but you built a beautiful room that i mean that room i don't think it, folks have ever been there it's been any time there i mean to watch a band there it's the acoustics in the place is amazing yeah. the low ceiling just i'm not sure what you have for material behind the stage but it, just the whole thing is a really nice vibe and it's a beautiful sound well i you know if, it, if you're going to have live sound it should be good that's right um but when i first started thinking about the sound system in the place i this is another thing about being an Air Force brat, but I played football in uh, grade 12 in Summerside High School with a friend of mine, Barry Hurdle, who wound up getting into the audio biz, and he's got a place called Hurdle Sound in Charlottetown. Mm. So I called him, and he came in and looked at me and said, well, what are you looking for? And I said, well, I want to be able to walk in off the street and walk all the way through the club and not hear a change in the volume or the coverage music period i want it to sound exactly the same at the bar as it does in the other corner of the dining room so that when the bartender turns the music up he knows it's exactly as loud as he's hearing it and if that could somehow double as a pa system that would be awesome so we put in the system right. and it doubled as a pa yep. and it uh it worked like a charm 
Uh, and But my idea was to put like one act in a month and do it on slow nights for restaurants, like a Monday, Tuesday, or a Sunday, Monday, or a Tuesday, Wednesday, or whatever. And so an act that can maybe do multiple nights, like two or three nights or something. So because I'd worked with Joel, he was very, he said, yeah, man, you know, I'll do it. I'll be the guinea pig. So he went up and did an acoustic show. And the next month, I think he had Joel Barber. And the month after that, my friend Steve Poltz came from um, San Diego to play. And, and by then, it was like, oh, okay. So then my partners said, well, you should book more live music. And I'm going, that is a very slippery yeah. slope, my yeah. friends. Yeah. It's very slippery. Yeah. But by the fall, you know, business was sucking. So I couldn't blame them. So we started to, you know, book more music and then book bands for the weekends. And, you know, we gradually beefed up the size of the speakers and the sound. We kept an array system, but beefed it up to the point where we could take pretty much any band. And it could be a rock thing, it could be an acoustic thing, it could be anything. So the sound system's just gotten better and better and better and better and better over the years. And obviously we wound up morphing into a live music venue, or at least that's what we're best known for. It's yeah, still, like I said, a great place to eat dinner. It's a great place to just go have a drink. But the whole culture has changed in the last 10 years in the city. You know, not as many people go downtown. All of those things. So I heard you on the radio with Jordy Morgan. You were doing that piece. I think you were like, um, uh, it was a while back where you were kind of talking about different sorts of albums you had been listening to. <laughs> I was telling that was the Squirrel FM. Was that what it was? Squirrel well, FM. I, I did hear you on Jordy Morgan though, and I remember one of the things that you talked about was selling tickets for shows and and doing that piece. Of, and it was interesting because on the Dartmouth side, that's what we've been doing since it, we opened up. We're selling tickets, and some musicians want their guarantee. One of the things that we've been saying now with this whole selling thing, it's kind of making people have to hustle a little bit more and really sell themselves. But when you sell out, you can probably make more money than you ever have in the past. Um, but you, I guess, sharpen your teeth on that side of things. Um, wh how has it been going? Obviously, with reduced numbers and stuff, mm. a sellout isn't you know a sellout, but no. it, it, it means quite a bit. Uh, but how how is that going? And how, do you think that's a model that'll that'll stick around? Um. Yeah. I'm <laughs> When I started to do the live stuff, um, before I moved, uh, no, I guess it was here already, but, but by the time I decided I was going to do a place that was going to be a venue, I had several pieces of advice from my friend X. Ray McRae, who owned the horseshoe for years and years and years and years and years, and he said uh, two things, never guarantee anybody anything. Never sign a contract. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was like, <clears throat> didn't you? And he goes, no. Uh, oh. And then I had another friend who was an, who was an agent uh, who came to visit me after the Carlton had opened, and he was on his way to Los Angeles uh, to join Live Nation. Mm -hmm. He was an agent and artist manager. And he said to me, he came in one afternoon, I hadn't seen him in years, I said, dude, what are you doing? Oh, man, I'm going to go to L.A. and join the Rapino, you know, live nation. I said, like, that's great. And he goes, so you're doing, you're doing live stuff here? And I said, yeah. He said, uh, so... And I said, well, I just took X-ray's advice, you know. He just said, you know, never give anybody a guarantee and don't sign contracts. And so this agent, manager, said, <laughs> that's awesome. Wow. Keep it up. Wow. Yeah. And that's literally, you know, allowed us to survive on that side of it. And there's two reasons for it. It's not because we're assholes, but it's because um, all it would take in a market as finicky and fickle as Halifax yep. Yep. and as resistant and new as Halifax is, um, all it would take was, you know, me making a miscalculation and guaranteeing somebody quite a bit of money yeah. and then not being able to sell tickets I'd be out of business like that and the other thing is if you do a no guarantee thing then you're in partnership with the artist I was just going to say to promote the show yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know how many agents have told me well you know they're good for like this is a great band I said well if it's a great band they're as good as you say you are and you have as many fans as you say you are then why are you so obsessed with guarantees yeah. mm -hmm. like 
it should be a no-brainer. But it puts us in partnership with the act. Mm -hmm. So I expect the act to work as hard on the show as I do. Yes. And there's only so much we can do. Yeah. I mean, we don't have an advertising budget. We don't have any of that. We have a very good newsletter that goes out to like 4,000 people that ask to get it. So that's an edge. Uh, and, you know, we've got uh, publicists and we get our listings out and I'm available or anybody's available to do interviews with anybody who wants to talk to us about anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and we will facilitate interviews uh, certainly with bands that aren't local, so we coordinate efforts with publicists and uh, for any media outlet. But the band is the one that has direct access to their fans. Yep. The bands yep. are the ones that can reach out and tell people the gig's happening. I don't know how many shows we've done at the Carlton, and I get people going, I just heard so-and-so play to your place. What the hell? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, why didn't I know? And I go, well, what do you expect me to do? Phone you personally or right. something? I mean, right. Jesus, man, like all over the place. We're yeah. in the, like everywhere. So you're just not paying attention, or why don't you sign up for the newsletter and you can get all of this stuff? Yeah. You know, like you'll be able to see all of this stuff. So, um, you know, that's one of those reasons. <laughs> oh my God. What's up, brother? Sorry. That's all right. Well, I, I love the fact of what you said about the partnership piece because um, one of the things that I found, so we were doing a number of shows. This is going to continue. No, that's all right. What's up, bud? He's being a bitch. Come here. <laughs> Come here. Well, it's good time to, good time to scale around. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we want to be even so much free time anyhow, but we're almost getting ready to wrap up. I just, this is the coolest place I think I've ever been. There's so much stuff here, and I'm sure every single per thing in here has some special meaning to you. But, oh, there's an old my music camera. Right now. Yeah. Um, all the lanyards. So here, here's the point I was going to make, David, and, 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 and Mike. Um, so we did a number of shows over at Mondays sure, and Dartmouth. Yeah. And so they had reduced capacity. So their full capacity was, I think it's 500 people. They were allowed between 100 and 180. So I went to Nancy oh, and I just, drink. absolutely. I went to Nancy and I just said, look, let me give you a hand promoting. So we, we use our platform and we've been promoting stuff. And so we were able to sell out not only our own shows, but we were able to sell out some other shows as well. And one of the things that we found immediately is we were able to go to the Molsons of the world, create some partnerships with them to try to get them to do some stuff. So I found that to your point, it put me in a position where uh, I was the partner with the club owner and I was putting my money where my mouth is. We mm -hmm. were. And um, so I, I love what you're saying about that. I, I, it's a model I, I like because I can also control. If I know I get X amount of tickets is X amount, I can tell everybody what they're, what they're making. Yep. And if you sell out, you're good. I think yeah. it's a model that should be around and, and stick around. Yeah, I mean, I do, you know, I work with, um, work with outside promoters. You know, there's a couple of people who've got relationships with artists and they want to do the shows. I mean, Sonic has done shows with us. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So Mark Horton's a very good buddy of mine. I played yeah. in a band with Mark. Yeah, you know, like they they booked in um, like Colin Hay from uh, from Men at Work and uh, what the fuck's his name? Is this good name? Well, like Matt Costa and a few other people because mm -hmm. most bands coming in from outside the area want to establish a relationship with the biggest promoter in the, in the place. And Sonic, for the most part, deals with much much bigger shows. So mm -hmm. you know, but if they can develop the relationship with the artist and they can make money and the artist will be happy. We just give them the room, basically. Mm -hmm. right. They sell the tickets, they take the risk, and for sure they're offering guarantees and stuff. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, because that's a whole other and level. And you just sell some beer. That's a whole other level, yeah. We sell some beer and food and, and it helps us, you know, because it's a, there's a little bit of cred involved. You sure. Know? It's like these artists have played your room. And uh, you know, I think it's... It's important to, to be able to, you know, use the stage for all kinds of different reasons, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, the new owner, Karen Spalding, is much like me. You know, she's committed to, committed not only to the artists that we have, but to help breaking new talent and giving a stage to people that deserve it. You know, even if they don't have an audience, then we have to work triply hard. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I was famously the first guy to give July talk at fucking Kega out here. And that band, I thought, was just going to, was, undeniably good so you know the terms of the thing with the agent I say okay well here's what we're gonna do it's yeah. the middle of the week you know 
I know it's a five-piece band, and you're traveling, you know, they weren't traveling as a sound person at that point. It was like a five-piece band, you're mm -hmm. on the road. You gotta pay for hotels and gas and everything else. Mm -hmm. so, but it's Wednesday in Halifax. Nobody's ever heard of it. Like, they're not gonna come out if the ticket price is what it should be. So I said, you know, it's gonna be a 10 buck ticket. You know, if we sell it out, and I'm, uh, I think I'm gonna be able to sell it out. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll have a thousand bucks, and that'll pay for your hotels. And yeah, yeah. It'll pay, you can, you'll actually make a little bit of money, and we'll give you some drinks and that kind of shit. And they did it. And I sold it out um, based on the fact that the band was also filmmakers, so the video was insanely good. And you've mm -hmm. got a very good idea about what the band was. But anybody who was in the room that night knew that you were seeing something Special. ridiculously good. Mm -hmm. And then we booked them back a couple months later and did two shows, right. except it wasn't 10 bucks anymore, now it was 15 bucks. Mm -hmm. Then I had to book them back in December, the same year, and I had to put them in a seahorse because my room wasn't big enough and we only had like the, you know, the one day to be in town. And then I, even when I sold out the seahorse, then we added a matinee show at the Carlton. Right. So it could be all ages and it's only four doors down. That's so, you know, within the space of a year, we sold out five shows, well, you know, and the band was way too big to ever play my room again. But they also offered me the opportunity to promote like a bigger show, sure. and I was like, nah, I don't have the wherewithal to do that. You know? So well, that's a good question. Like, you know, again, we want to be respectful of your time, Mike. I mean, I just, this place is so amazing. But it's what's next for Mike Campbell now? Is what's post pandemic, during pandemic? What's next? What's next? Yeah. <clears throat> It's a very interesting question, and one that a lot of people would let know the answer to, including me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, right now, the Carlton takes up most of my brain space, but, uh, you know, every day I'm constantly doing, you know, I've been on the board of Music Nova Scotia for 20 years, and I've worked with the ECMAs, and I've worked with all kinds of different organizations, uh, but mostly, you know, this place, is this office is affectionately known as the Tiki Lounge, throughout the Canadian music industry, and I can start throwing names at you with people that have been in here, mm -hmm. like they're tragically hip, and like half, the, half, the Canadian, half the Canadian bands that have come to this city have been in here at one point. Really? Yeah. Um, so it's a fairly well-known spot. So um, I will continue, I think, to work with local artists, mm -hmm. you know? Um, uh, but for the time being, as long as I can remain um, interested in music, I'll continue to do the programming at the Carlton. I'd like to build the Halifax Urban Folk Festival into a much larger operation than it currently is. Um, but there's also a ton of possibilities for this room. So I've done live performances in here. You really? Ron Hines has played in here. Joel Plask has played in here. Gordy Johnson from Big Sugar has played in here. Um, right where that couch is, actually. We moved that up. up. That's a little stage. Um, so I think that we'll probably start doing some kind of multimedia stuff out of this garage. Well, that's a good idea. The thing that you were talking about to Jordy about, uh, like every day uh, when he was filling in for Rick Howe, I would pick a song that should have been a hit, yeah. that wasn't a hit. And that's the premise for a radio station that we dreamt up in like 15, 16 years ago, sitting around here. Uh, you know, the kind of radio station we want to listen right. to. Yeah, yeah. Hits from an alternative universe. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we decided that it, our radio station wouldn't be like the wolf or the bear or the lizard. It would be the squirrel. Squirrel. <laughs> squirrel, like a, a squirrel. Like a yeah. single-minded, absolutely will-not-back-down rodent that just will not leave you alone if it gets into your rafters. So it's always been this thing that we've thought of, and uh, I've since been thinking about it more and more. Uh, so it would be a radio station that operates out of here. We can get a 50-watt license from the uh, Department of Transport. You don't have to go through the CRTC. You just have to have a good reason to do it. And uh, that can encompass all kinds of things, but the basis of it, would be, and we'd have online, obviously, to be online yeah. as well and everything else. So as I move into that kind of stuff, as, as I'm... Uh, also, I've got a thousand uh, raw Mike and Mike tapes, Betacam tapes in the basement. Wow. Um, that I'm finally getting my shit together to 
digitized. And once I have that together, then I can start taking bits and pieces of that, putting them together, and then writing about the memories, and then inserting video and that kind there of There must stuff. have been some amazing blooper reels from, reels from that stuff. There must have been some blooper reels. Oh my God. Yes, too many. Most of them, <laughs> yeah. most of them yeah. is bloopers. But I mean, you know, at the day's point, I want to be respectful of your time, but I mean, that's just like, obviously, that looks like such a, a hoot. I mean, to get paid to go across the country to see a bunch of stuff. Oh, the only music, terrible but... thing about that job is that you can't complain about it. Right. <laughs> like, what? Fair You're going enough. across the country with your best friend. Somebody else is paying for it. It was a question. Music. Who pays for you guys' as hotel rooms? Was, what do you mean? Jesus, this is a job, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, it was a, it was a, it was an absolute, um, absolute pleasure. It was the best job in the world. Well, if there'd been more money, we wouldn't have to do the, the, like a lot of super ignorant things, like traveling across the prairies in January. Yeah, yeah. Shooting outside and stuff, but yeah, nobody did. Like we used to do interviews with people on the road. We did this one interview in Winnipeg or something. I think the guy was going, and we we're telling him, "It's like no, we just take off." And he goes, "You need to tell me that." Chances are nobody that much knows where you are right now. I said, try it on for size. <laughs> and said, here's Denise Donnellan's phone number. Give her a phone call. Ask her the question. So he goes, so we're in the interview. He calls. And they get Denise and asks her. It doesn't say why. And uh, she goes, not nah, really. I mean, I might be able to find out, but no, nope, off the top of my head. Pretty sure they're in Canada. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pretty That's sure, amazing. but sometimes we weren't in Canada. You know, we got to go all over the place. It was... Uh, it was a great gig, yeah. But it made you feel like one hundred percent Canadian. Like I said, sure. it was an Air Force brat. He was born in Vancouver. I've lived as far east as PEI. I've been everywhere there is to be in this country. I think we did a show from any town that had at least fifteen thousand people in it over the six years that we did it. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was, let's go. So we were probably let's... twenty years too late. Is what you're trying to yeah, say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, well, boys, the other beautiful thing about the show, and the reason I think it resonated with a lot of people, is that any two guys or gals out there could look at us and go, Fuck, we could do that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and the answer is no. That's not well, that's necessarily thing. true. That's the it thing. is not true. Right? It's people don't way get that. more, it's not what you think. Like, we get people, you guys are drunk and high all the No, never, ever, when we were on camera, ever. Yeah. Never. I mean, the fact that you guys thought we were, I mean, that's fun. I mean, I like that, but no, yeah. we would never be like that. But I mean, one thing's for sure that, you know, at this stage of my life, it's a little bit too late to pack up and decide to do something else. So whatever it is I wind up doing, it's definitely going to be here yeah. in Halifax. And then, you know. In this friggin' cool tiki bar. In this cool, well, yeah, and in you this, know, in this cool uh, we're, we're, we're certainly glad you're here, Mike, because, I mean, you gave a shot in the armor of the business for sure. And, I mean, you came in with... Um, uh, obviously, a, a knowledge of the business and the connections and stuff like that. And um, I mean, I remember the early '90s, and it always seemed to be a closed door society. If you weren't kind of in yeah. with certain groups, you didn't. The door wasn't open to you. And mm. um, I think it's pretty good now. Um, when the Carlton opens back up again, we'd be more than happy to do whatever we can to promote all your shows. And like I say, I love the room. I've played yeah. there before. Absolutely. Um, People need to get down there and see it. Well, we'll make sure that you're on our media list, boys. Yeah. <laughs> that, we'll make that happen for sure. So how can they find you? Uh, just go to the carlton.ca. And uh, the best idea is to sign up for our weekly newsletter. And if you guys haven't, you should. You know what? And that's how I found you was the carlton.ca. So it does yeah. But the newsletter, uh, for the last year... I've been writing about my experiences and the Mike and Mike shows and much music and anything to do with music, period, right uh, from my life and stuff. So I write these essays and I have photographs and all of this stuff. And I think that's a, uh, about, I don't say all the people, there's tons of people that don't bother to read it, I'm sure, that get the newsletter. But for some people, it's the reason they get the newsletter. So I'm going to sign up. As soon as we get home, for sure. This is how we roll. Well, Mike, we want to say thanks for coming on the Versals and Band Talk show. Because I mean, to this, I mean, I, this is the coolest thing, place I think I've been. Oh yeah. No, just, <laughs> and we've been doing this for years. Like I just feel, I feel so at home and so peaceful here. I don't know how to explain it. Well, it's but, a beautiful place. I don't know how busy you guys are, but you're more than welcome to have a beer at the bar with me. At this point. Absolutely, like. love to. Well then, I will get you the beer. It was thanks, great guys. talking to you guys. Bye. Thank you. Peace out. I'm just gonna go.